Having discussed the basic gates and the basic laws of Boolean algebra, let's now look at a few common logic blocks that you'll frequently see in microprocessors. Let's start by looking at what is described as a decoder. So a decoder has a number of output wires, and one of those output wires is made active or made high depending on what the input is. So in this figure over here, I'm showing you an example of a 3 to 8 decoder, which means I have eight outputs, and one of those eight outputs is going to be made high in any one given cycle. And which of those eight is made high depends on what the input code is. So there's a three bit input code, which is enough for me to specify one of eight different values. And based on that input code, one of these wires is made active, right? So the corresponding truth table is shown over here, where I have three inputs. And these three inputs essentially denote a number between zero and seven. And accordingly, one of the outputs, either 0, 01, 02, all the way up to 07, is then correspondingly made high, right? So you'll see that, you know, given a set of inputs, exactly one of the outputs is made high. So if I give this as input, exactly one of the outputs is made high. And the output that is made high, in this case 02, is denoted by the value of this code over here, right? So this is the binary number 2. And so correspondingly, 02 is made active. So why is this useful? We've described register files, we've described memory before, right? So what is memory? Memory is this really large chunk of data. It's a bunch of, you know, zeros and ones stored as bits. And when I give an address, I read something out. The way I do that is there's a decoder stage usually before a memory element. I provide an address over here. And based on that address, one of these rows is made active and the values in that row are then read out, right? So that's the main use of a decoder. It's always used before a memory element. The address that I provide, if there are two to the power n rows in my memory, then I need to provide an n bit address over here. And that then picks out one of these wires, makes only that one wire active, and that's the one row that I read out. So that's the main use of a decoder. The opposite in some sense of a decoder is a multiplexer. What it does is it takes multiple inputs, right? So I'm showing you a two input multiplexer over here, but in general, a multiplexer has multiple inputs coming in and it has exactly one output. And the value of this output essentially mirrors one of these input lines, okay? So in any one given cycle, it's as if one of these wires is short-circuited to the output. And the wire that is short-circuited is determined by looking at an input code, in this case, S, right? So I provide an input code S, which tells me which one of these wires should be essentially short-circuited to the output. And so if there are two to the power N inputs over here, I need an N bit code over here that tells me exactly which of these two to the N wires needs to be connected to the output. Okay, so in this case, with the two input marks, you can see that the circuit is really simple. So if S is one, then basically what is coming out of this AND gate is B dot S. If S is one, then what comes out of the AND gate is B. If S is one, then what comes here is S bar. So zero is coming in over here. And so A dot zero gives me zero. So the result coming out of here, C, is nothing but B odd with zero, which is nothing but B, right? So this does implement that logic. When S is one, the value of the output C is exactly the value of B. If S is zero, then exactly the reverse happens where what comes out of here is B dot zero. So zero is coming out here. What comes out over here is A dot the inverse of S, which is one. So what comes out here is A. And what comes out of the OR gate C is A odd with zero, which is nothing but A itself. So when S is zero, the value of, value of C is A. When S is 1, the value of C is B. Right. So that's how you implement a multiplexer function saying that depending on this code that I provide, the output is just going to be exactly equal to one of the inputs. So where is a MUX useful? Right. So usually there are a number of values being provided by various circuits and one of those has to eventually be provided as an output and that's where you use a multiplexer. And what I'm going to describe next is an arithmetic and logical unit where we will use multiple multiplexers, right? So by the time you're done with the next few videos, you'll have some very good examples of where multiplexers are applied. 
So we've seen some basic circuits like the decoder, the multiplexer, next is the adder. And we'll use all of these to build more complicated circuits on, in the next few videos. So let's just go through an example add operation. Again, you've seen this many times before. I'm adding two numbers A and B. A is 1001 and B is 0101. So when I'm adding these two bits over here, it's 1 plus 1 gives me the result 1, 0. The least significant bit 0 is kept here as the sum. And the more significant bit, 1, is moved up as the carry. Right, So that moves on to the addition over here. So in the next step, I'm going to add 1, 0, 0. That gives me a sum of 1 and the carry of 0. So 0 then gets carried over to the next stage. So it's 0 plus 0 plus 1, which again gives me a sum of 1, a carry of 0. That moves on to the next step and, and so on. So again, this is a simple logical unit. This is a combinational circuit where the outputs being produced are entirely determined by the inputs. And so in this case, there are three inputs. And so you can draw out a truth table saying that here are my inputs A, B, and the carry N. And based on the three values that I'm receiving in any given step, I'm going to produce a result for the sum and the carry out that is being generated. Okay, so here is what that truth table would look like. And note that this is a truth table for every one bit addition, right? So when I'm doing this math over here, the result is determined by looking at this truth table, right? So for that one bit addition, I have three inputs, the values of that bit for A, the value of the bit for B, and the value of the carry in that's coming in from the previous stage. And depending on those three values, I'm going to produce a certain least significant bit, which is the sum, and the most significant bit, which is the carry that goes to the next stage, right? So given that there are three inputs, each having a value of 0, 1, there are eight possible scenarios, and for each of those eight scenarios, I've listed out what the values of sum and carry out are going to be. And once I've done this, I can now come up with the corresponding equations, right? So we can come up with a sum of products or a product of sums equation. In this case, this is a sum of products. So for sum, I look at each of the cases where the result is a one, and I produce a product term for each of those cases, right? And then I just add those up. Similarly for C out as well, there are four cases where the output is one. So I come up with four terms over here. It also turns out that this can be further simplified. So if you look at these two terms here, it's basically A dot B times C in plus C in bar, right? And this term is always going to be a one because one of these two is bound to be one. So it becomes A dot B dot one, which is nothing but AB. So those two terms get simplified into A dot B. And similarly, you can simplify the other terms as well to come up with this equation over here. Now, this basic one-bit addition step is, is fairly easy to implement, right? We've, we've come up with equations for both the sum and the carryout terms. They are expressed with this relatively simple sum of products equation. And you know, here's an example to, sh to show you that this is indeed fairly simple logic, right? So here's a block that shows you how you would implement the carryout function, right? So it's basically three simple AND gates which each have you know two inputs and then I'm taking a three input OR gate that takes the results of these AND gates and then produces the final carry out. Okay so this is relatively simple logic with just four different gates with no gate requiring more than three inputs and the delay through one of these circuits equals the delay to go through two sequential gates.